Is custody the next step in crypto's institutional adoption? Are Asian crypto hubs the stepping stone to European expansion? And as regulators warn against retail trading throughout Asia, are banks and institutions the beneficiaries of these alerts? Welcome to Word on the Block, the series that takes a deeper dive into blockchain and the emerging technologies that shape our world at the intersection of business, politics, and economy. It's what we cover right here on Forecast News. I'm Forecast Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Well, through the last couple of months, we've seen Asian authorities send warnings against retail crypto trading from India to Hong Kong to even Singapore. The trend has been on the rise. But as we've discussed recently here on Word on the Block, the validation of digital assets is intriguing to banks and institutions. So what's the next step for institutional adoption? Perhaps... It's time to talk about custody. Joining me right now is the CEO of digital asset custodian Hex Trust, who just closed a $6 million Series A round. Welcome to Alessio Quaglini. Alessio, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me here, Angie. Absolutely. So we're both uh, Hong Kong based. We're here in Asia. The perspective is just so clear to us here in this region. But for everybody else who's just joining in from around the world, what are you seeing here in Asia from the custodian point of view that you think can really uh, accelerate adoption for institutionals and traditional investors here in this region? What are people looking for? I think obviously uh, in the past few months, there's been a great uh, shift uh, from a more retail and unregulated uh, type of business to a more institutional business. The shift to the institutional business is just a reflection of a couple of things. So the first one is the interest of the wider group of investor in getting exposure to a new asset class that has different characteristics from the more traditional asset classes. The second one is, a, is an interest in the new business models in financial markets that the blockchain technology has brought to the financial markets itself. So what we are seeing now is actually the institutions trying to get into the space in order to enable digital asset services for uh, their clients, both at the wholesale banking space and at the retail space. Asia as the home of innovation. I agree with you, Alessio. Hong Kong and this region in the world is really at the forefront of innovation. What specifically are you seeing that, that allows your firm to uh, really thrive and grow and, and get to a point that it has now? And congratulations, by the way, you just closed $6 million Series A round. So I think... In the, in the wider uh, blockchain market, uh, custody really represents a very important piece of the whole market. Um, it's not just about bringing services to the market, but as we move to a more institutional market, as we move to a more regulated and compliant market, you will need to, you, every single player will need to have an underlying platform that allows you to basically comply with the four key factors. One, that is security. The second one is regulation and compliance. The third one is, that is interoperability with all the other systems and service providers available in the market. And the fourth one is scalability. And how we see custody in Hex Trust is really to address these four main topics that are so critical in the blockchain market. And it's really validating the, the rising interest in cryptocurrency here in Asia as well uh, on the institutional and traditional side. Can you share just what your experience is so far and, and where you're seeing growth? Well, obviously, as we mentioned, um, as we are seeing more or less everywhere, we have a lot of uh, institutional inv investors' interest coming to the space. So this comes, first of all, as a reflection of uh, investors wanting to have exposure to a new asset class that is different uh, from the traditional asset classes, especially in this kind of a, a moment in the history of, um, of the world where central banks are kind of uh, competing with each other 
in uh, printing money. So there's an interest in the in an asset class that behaves in a different way. And there's a difference in the new business models that blockchain is bringing to the financial markets. So, and the different business models are the ones that we're currently exploring and talking about and providing interfaces to, which are the business models in the DeFi space, the new business models in the CeFi space that allow actually to, to earn uh, while holding the assets in your portfolios. All right, so we're talking about the lending and borrowing platforms, we're talking about the staking platforms, we're talking about different types of investing, uh, your liquidity in businesses that are embedded in the blockchain space. See, that's really interesting because we are also increasingly watching this space move DeFi into CeFi. Um, obviously, traditional firms are watching the DeFi space very closely um, and then trying to think about how to incorporate that or take advantage or even leverage. What you're talking about sounds really interesting in that as a custodian for traditional and institutional investors, to have that entire you know, asset class of Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever other cryptocurrency that they ultimately hold in their corporate treasury, that then they could also, in effect, act as a CIO uh, and, and use DeFi. Um, but how do you how do you ensure, uh, you know, um, how do you ensure all of the stakeholders from the board all the way down to shareholders that that, you know, that hedge already in crypto, which we're seeing enormous volatility, um, is going to be implied is going to be applied in DeFi. Uh, what are the how how would you how how can the institutions think about that and still remain compliant? I think that's a couple of things that have to be taken into consideration here. So I think the corporate treasury function within uh, corporations and also the management of assets and liabilities in financial institutions will have to shift from a uh, secondary function to a first order business function. So the management of liquidity going forward will take the, the, will take the primary stage in the, in the business activities of, um, of large financial institutions and corporations. And we're seeing this not just in the news piece of Tesla or MicroStrategy uh, buying Bitcoins, but we're seeing this also from uh, smaller companies or family offices or smaller businesses, even listed companies here in Asia that are, that are looking at doing the same. Then at the same time, once you open the door to digital assets, then you find that you'll have a lot of options on the table on what you can do with these digital assets. And you're right. So how do you make sure that you can control the volatility and that you are doing the right investment uh, investments, managing the risks that it comes with them? So that's why you will need to handle it as a business function where there is a risk department that is able to understand not only the financial risks of these assets, but the compliance risks and all the other risks that have to be controlled in the other business functions of a company. But the DeFi, DeFi space is very interesting. And I think um, when, when, the, um, when Compound came to market uh, last year, I think what it created was a very big shift from the way we look at cash management uh, before DeFi and after DeFi. Before DeFi, if you have US dollars in your bank account, you either have US dollars or you have to invest them into something. Uh, with DeFi, you have the, the birth of a new asset class, which is the interest yielding currency. So you can transform your US dollar into a CUSD. And this CUSD is the same thing as a US dollar with the only difference that itself can earn interest and increase in value. So all of a sudden you have a kind of CD instrument in your balance sheet and it increases in value at every single block that is confirmed on the blockchain. But the interesting thing is that this instrument becomes negotiable 
and can be used to purchase other assets or can be used to be invested itself. So we're, we're really shifting from pure non-yielding assets to yielding assets that have interest bearing functionalities built into the assets itself. And I think it's a very powerful shift that the blockchain is bringing to the whole financial markets. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, right now, it is still in its very much infancy. Um, uh, to, to, you know, it's growing up. It's growing up fast, uh, but infancy in the way that you know. How do we see the migration of DeFi? and these new ways of thinking about financial instruments and then actually applying it in, in a more traditional landscape. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is an opportunity for institutions and for you know, firms uh, like yourself and so many others who are actually working on solution, uh, uh, solutions right now that they can they can manage their the the cryptocurrency assets and still play in this space and really you know uh have it function in as a hedge and more you are referring to as a hedge for the other against the other currencies available in the market that's right. I'm I'm talking about uh negative yields, I'm talking about uh US dollar, Japanese yen, Singapore th dollar, uh, traditional fiat. Yeah. I think there is a um there's an, another important uh shift in the market. So especially in periods of high volatility, investors always look for a safe haven asset, right? And the safe haven assets historically has been the Swiss franc, the Japanese yen, sometimes the US dollar, depending on what investors were looking for. Or gold. Now yeah. or gold, exactly. Now uh, we are in a period of time in which investors are becoming more and more aware that just by, ju by just holding a safe have a traditional safe have an asset, they will experience depreciation of the asset itself. And this money printing of the central bank will actually have a clear impact on the depreciation in the medium and long term of these assets. Investors are aware of that. And I'm looking for alternatives. Obviously, gold is an alternative, but gold comes with all the all the issues that we know about the transfer transferability, whether it can be spent, whether it can be reinvested, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sounds very familiar. Digital <laughs> assets are really an alternative. Obviously, within digital assets, you have a whole range of very different things. But if we talk about for a second just about Bitcoin is really the typical asset that investors are looking for to hedge against this uh, money printing uh, process that is going that is going on around around the world then you have other assets like the the secondary uh, blockchains such as ethereum polkadot that are used to sustain the whole blockchain ecosystem the blockchains on top of which all the other blockchain based businesses, including DeFi, will have to be built. So if investors think that this new way of building financial markets is going to actually gain market share in the financial markets, then uh, Ethereum and the other smart contracts, blockchains, will actually play a role in, uh, in the hedge uh, against the, uh, financial, the traditional financial markets. Then obviously, at the at the other uh, on the other side of the blockchain world, you have art NFTs. You have other kind of tokens that that behave more like securities. You have community tokens. You have go governance tokens, and all of these assets that will behave in a completely uh, different way compared to Bitcoin and Ethereum. Even though obviously now we're seeing a very high correlation, and the market is usually going just in one direction, uh, following the, the largest cap assets. Yeah, it's, it's true. When, when you take a look at the regulatory space here in Asia, um, how, do you, how do you compare Hong Kong and Singapore? How do you, how do you care, compare the, what's happening in the region? Okay, so um, 
for, first of all, a general uh, a general statement on what governments are doing, right? So I think regulation is coming to the space, and this is not surprising at all, right? It was supposed to be happening. It's just, in my opinion, happening a little bit too late, right? And the lag and denial of some governments around the world to actually get getting into this space and bringing some regulations and regulatory framework actually had the opposite effect of spurring unregulated businesses, targeting most of the times the weakest uh, group of clients and investors. So right now, due to the lag in bringing regulatory frameworks to the space, we have huge businesses offering to the widest group of unsophisticated and uneducated part of the population, very sophisticated products such as perpetual futures, options, uh, leverage up to 100 times. And uh, this is just the, reflect, the reflection of a big delay in coming to this market by the, uh, by the authorities. Now, if we want to compare, on, but this regulation is coming, if we want to compare Hong Kong to Singapore, I don't really want to take a side, right? But what I would say is that both Hong Kong and Singapore have very active blockchain markets, and we have both uh, very established businesses as well as growing or new enterprises entering the market in Hong Kong and Singapore. If we just want to focus on the regulatory perspective, I would say that Singapore has been more agile than Hong Kong in proposing some types of regulatory framework that are more conducive to crypto to running cryptocurrency businesses under the sun. In Hong Kong, we'll have to catch up if we want to stay competitive and if we want to avoid that digital asset businesses or innovative businesses in general start moving even faster at a faster pace to Singapore. It's it's a race. There's very little doubt about that. Um, you're expanding both in Singapore and Hong Kong uh, to, uh, as I read in your in, in my notes here, to meet Asia's soaring institutional interest in digital assets. Um, I also note that you're also expanding to Europe. What are you bringing to Europe that you've learned in Asia that you think can be exported to the rest of the world? All right. So first of all, our Key market is obviously Asia, where we want to become and be the regional leader for digital asset custody. But uh, we also understand that the blockchain business is a global 24 7, 365 business. And it cannot be run just from one geographical area. So if you want to run a global business and being able to cover clients and provide a an interrupted service globally, you have to have presence in different parts of the world. So Europe for us is also a strategic market. Uh, we're planning to actually uh, set up a strong presence in Europe in 2020. Then the global pandemic kind of uh, slowed down this process, but uh, we are re-evaluating, we're currently re-evaluating the strategy and in 2021, we will um, we will decide where we want to be, in which parts of Europe we want to be, and where we want to set up what type of business. But certainly in 2021, we will have a strong presence in Europe. The continent, I mean, you, you, let's call it continental yeah. Europe. Continent. <laughs> You've got extensive experience in, in finance and, and in banking. And obviously, this has been a, a, a very regulated space. Uh, the, the institutional investors that are coming on board um, obviously need those rails, those regulatory rails to, to even be, you know, uh, thinking about uh, doing business in crypto. So now that these products are coming, uh, to your point, the regulatory space is shifting, whether, you know, at a, at a speed that doesn't necessarily match the innovation. Um, but still, it feels very much that the regulatory space is tightening. How do you navigate um, uh, that, number one? Um, but how does that also change the, the game for, for banks and institutions? I mean, is this still a level playing field? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, to be honest, this is a big competitive advantage for us. So we, when we set up the company uh, three years ago, the idea is, was really to bring on one side a very competitive product platform for custody, settlement, and interoperability of digital assets. But on the other side, to bring it to the market within a fully regulated and compliance, uh, compliant framework. So we planned ahead for uh, this to come, and we were expecting that regulators would come with strictest uh, regulations to this market. Right. So the whole the whole business, the way we set it up, the licenses that we apply for, the licenses that we obtained, the type of uh, partners that we work with, the certifications that we obtained in the market, they were all um, that it was all done strategically thinking that strict regulation will come to the market. So now I think to answer your question, the barrier of entry to this market is much higher than before. New entrants uh, will not only have to uh, compete in terms of product competitiveness and the kind of the sophistication of requests and requirements from clients now so much higher than before, but they will also have to compete on the regulatory side, which is becoming much and much uh, harder to comply with. And we're not only talking about AML, we're not only talking about CTF, we're also talking about, about GDPR rules, we're talking about um, how to comply with the new travel rule regulations and how to make sure that you can comply with this regulation on a global or at least multi-geographical uh, kind of uh, basis, right? So our target clients are global businesses that operate in different jurisdictions. So how can we allow them to be compliant in the jurisdictions where they want to launch this digital asset business? And look, what you're doing and, and others like you uh, really providing on ramps of trust for some smart money and by smart money i mean a lot of it um you know these are tranches of uh hundreds of millions if not billions um when we think about even just at the one to two percent level of corporate treasuries uh, around the world that brings an enormous amount of liquidity uh in this space i also note that it is also a transfer of power or players, you know, in the retail space, but now there's serious money into this space. It's displacing maybe the early anarchists and the cypherpunks that, you know, bought pizzas with their Bitcoin. And now, um, you know, people are hedging their corporate treasury in crypto against negative yield environment and uh, over stimulus uh, in, in many people's opinions as to what central banks are doing around the world. Um, so that that's really different. So now you're you're providing this liquidity into this space. What do you think is going to launch all of this money, all of serious money? The, the regulators are here to to create the rails of trust. Uh, what do you think it's going to launch in the next decade when it comes to uh, financial vehicles, to DeFi, to uh, the next? the next layer of innovation in blockchain, uh, in financial services? I mean, obviously this is a very complex question, uh, but uh, what I would say is that, um, first of all, the trend is unstoppable, right? So you are right to say that we've seen probably in 2017, 18, more of a kind of retail uh, movement. Uh, now we're seeing not only the institutions, not only the listed companies, but we're seeing the family offices, we're seeing the high net worth yes. individuals, yes, we're seeing we the corporates, we're seeing a lot of different types of investors that are looking at the space. And this interest is growing since you mentioned, what if corporates actually allocate part of the treasury uh, to cryptocurrencies uh, in, the in the next few months? Well, there's a very interesting study that was published in, uh, in January 2021 by Ark Invest, Catherine Wood. And yes, uh, they... So they estimate that if only 1% of the cash in the S&P 500 corporates are allocated to Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin will basically reach 100,000 US dollars. So I think this is something that we will see happening. It will not take such a long time as other as we were expecting some months ago. 
right? Yeah. Uh, on the other side, in terms of business models, what we're looking at here is a big revolution. So Bitcoin is just a small part of it. Obviously, everybody is interested in the price of Bitcoin, in the safe haven asset, et cetera, et cetera. But what we're looking at here is a rebuild of a complete financial system. If you look at what uh, Ethereum is right now, for example, and if you look at what Visa is going to do with Ethereum, okay, it's basically using Ethereum as a global settlement layer that operates on a 24 by 7, 365 days a, uh, days, days a year. And it is a programmable settlement layer that works globally. So this is very powerful because right now we are uh, basically running our financial services on a legacy system that obviously, I mean, work, works quite well, but has a lot of deficiencies. Right, but this financial infrastructure can actually be replaced by what we are building currently in the blockchain space. So this is what I think is the long-term trend that we will see, not even the ten, next ten years, but we will see in the next five years. So in, innovative companies working to rebuild this global settlement financial infrastructure layer. And we're not talking even about DeFi anymore. We're also thinking about new uh, digital asset classes like NFTs. You think there's institutional interest in NFTs? <laughs> I think uh, NFTs actually represent a lot of things, right? Obviously, the uh, the more uh, the, the the NFTs that are um, more interesting right now are digital art or other kinds of uh, um, computer games, experiments, etc. Um, this is actually a probably going to be a small niche of the NFT segment, but we will see more and more NFTs being applied to uh, IP, to identity, to uh, legal contracts, and to um, probably to some parts of um, the financial markets. So, NFTs will actually become an integral part of this new financial market infrastructure that I was uh, that I was mentioning before. And uh, I mean, as a consequence, businesses operating uh, in the space and offering services to institutional clients, they will have to have a full integration for uh, not only uh, Bitcoin or ERC twenty standards on Ethereum, but also the new NFT standards or even the new standards that are baskets or of NFTs and traditional tokens. So there's going to be a proliferation of new standards that, that will have to be supported by uh, custodian businesses like ours. Uh, listen, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to coin this new uh, role right now. The digital economist is coming. <laughs> We're going to need uh, economists who are well-versed in this space uh, and think about how it applies to that digital layer. Uh, that day is coming faster uh, than anyone can imagine. Alessio Quaglini, thank you so much. Uh, great to understand just the dynamic in this region, but also with more and more institutional money that is coming into the space. We're not even talking about Bitcoin prices anymore. You're truly talking about what that next layer of innovation is going to look like. So thanks for uh, shedding uh, a, a lot of light into the potential of what we can see in the future. Alessio, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me here, Angie. And thank you, everyone, for joining us on this latest episode of Word on the Block. I'm Angie Lau, Forecast News Editor-in-Chief. Until the next time.